Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. This is study number 36 in the book of Genesis. And we are in chapter 38, verse 1. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessings to the word that we are about to read. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 38, verse 1. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Actually, chapter 38 is a parenthesis in the life of Joseph. After his brothers sold Joseph into slavery, Judah, whose idea it was to sell him, moves about 15 miles away from, from dad and the rest of the family. Verse 2, And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went in to her. Judah moves into a Canaanite settlement and becomes good friends with a heathen named Hira. Then he married a heathen woman. Verse 3. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Chezib when she bore him. <clears throat> Notice Judah named the first child and his wife named the last two. Not a big deal, but it could be a symptom of an even bigger deal. Like as time went by, Judah's heathen wife may have had a bigger influence on the family than Judah. Something was stirring those boys the wrong way, that's for sure. Verse 6, Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Several years passed between verses 5 and 6. Judah's firstborn, Ur, is old enough to get married, and he does. 7, But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Ur was so ungodly that God killed him. Boy, what a waste. Ur dishonored God, and he cheated himself out of life. Verse 8. <clears throat> and Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. And that is what is known as the law of the kinsman redeemer, which was not really an official law, um, as far as the Ten Commandments because they had not or as far as the, the Levitical law because it had not been given yet but evidently it was understood that this was a law that if your brother died before he had children the next oldest brother surviving brother was to marry his wife and the first child that they had first son that they had would be given the name of the deceased brother that way his family line could carry on and so, this was Onan's responsibility to marry his dead brother's wife. Verse 9, But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went in to his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. Onan was disobedient. He was selfish. He did not want to raise up a son on behalf of his brother. And... Uh, when Judah, his father, dies, you know, the inheritance would only be split two ways if it's just Onan and his younger brother. But if Onan has a son on behalf of his dead brother, well, then the inheritance gets split three ways. And so what he did was wrong in the eyes of God. 10. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Someone says, boy, Lord, isn't that kind of severe? No. Wrong question. God is so merciful that people are shocked when he actually judges someone for sin. The question isn't, Lord, why did you judge? As I have said in the past, the real question is, Lord, why don't you judge more? Verse 11. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown, 
for he said, Lest ye also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. <clears throat> Judah is duty bound to give his youngest son to Tamar as a husband as soon as he is old enough to marry. But he does not want to. And deep down, he does not intend to. He doesn't want Sheila, his youngest, to die like the other two dead. 2. Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. Sheep shearing happened once a year. And it wasn't just, well, let's give our sheep a haircut. It was celebration time. And you can believe that in a heathen area like this, the celebration included a lot of sin. 13. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. And so Tamar sees what's going on. She understands that her father-in-law doesn't plan on giving his son to her. So she disguises herself as a temple prostitute, and she has a plan to blackmail Judah into letting her and Sheila get married. 15. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. Now, in that heathen land, the Canaanites expected their young daughters to do a religious tour of duty as a temple prostitute for their pagan gods. Tamar is disguised as one of those temple prostitutes. Judah sees her, doesn't recognize her, of course. Verse 16, Then he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, What will you give me, that you may come in to me? Bad company corrupts good morals. And when you have a man like Judah, who already had a head start on bad morals, it's even worse. You know, Judah's best friend is a heathen. He marries a heathen. And all the rot rubs off on his two sons who are so evil that God kills him. And now Judah does this. 17. And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, Will you give me a pledge until you send it? A pledge was sort of like a gift certificate. You show it, and you can claim your possession. She wants a gift certificate, a receipt that she can cash in for her goat. Verse 18. Then he said, What pledge shall I give you? So she said, Your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Judah is setting himself up for blackmail? You know, a person's signet ring was equivalent to a photo ID with your fingerprints on it. And so Judah is not just immoral, he's also reckless. And I guess he's reckless because he is immoral. Reckless or immoral people often risk their reputation and their health and even their life to satisfy their lusts. That's clearly happening here in 19. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. 20. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend the Adulamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. He was his friend, all right, the Adulamite, but he was not a good friend. A good friend does not lead you into sinful things. Verse 21. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot who was openly by the roadside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. You know, the word harlot actually means separated unto holy uses. These women were labeled harlot because they were dedicated to the goddess Venus and to the men who worshipped her through temple prostitution. Verse 22. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also the men of the place said, There was no harlot 
in that place. Well, he did his best, but he could not find the harlot. It seems as if she disappeared just as quickly as she appeared. 23. Then Judah said, Let her take them for herself, lest we be ashamed. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. Judah wants this thing to be over right now. No more searching for the harlot. No, no more asking around about her. If people figure out that Judah was foolish enough to give that harlot his signet ring, and that she tricked him out of it, he's going to be the subject of many jokes. So he just wants to leave it be. 24. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. According to custom, Tamar was already married to Judah's son, Shelah, because they were pledged, which means that she was guilty of adultery. And adultery was not acceptable in many heathen lands of that day. In fact, often, like here, it was punished by death. 25. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. And she pulls out the signet ring, and the sin that Judah thought was gone and forgotten was right there in the spotlight. 26. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Sheila my son, and he never knew her again. She was wrong to do what she did, but he was twice as wrong. She was guilty of, of immorality, but she was not motivated by lust. Her lawful desire to have a son in the name of her first husband is the thing that drove her. Judah was guilty of not giving his son to her, plus he was guilty of fornication. The hypocrite ought to call for his own death now, but of course he does not. 27. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth, that behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was, when she was giving birth, that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Then it happened, as he drew back his hand, that his brother came out unexpectedly, and she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. And the reason God includes these verses is because, believe it or not, Perez, the firstborn, is in the line of the Messiah. Judah and Tamar are both in the Messianic line. And both of them are examples of God's grace, aren't they? They illustrate that God uses flawed people to do great things. God uses flawed people because that's the only kind of people He has. We'll pick up our study in chapter 39.